So this is our fourth and last video for the chapter 14 chemical equilibrium lecture videos. The first two lecture videos introduced some of the concepts to the chapter. The third video showed how to work several problems with several examples. And this fourth video covers Le Chatelier's principle and finishes out the chapter. For the last part of the chapter, we'll be looking at disturbing and reestablishing equilibria. Once a reaction is at equilibrium, the concentrations of all the reactants and products remain the same. However, if the conditions are changed, the concentrations of all the chemicals will change until equilibrium is reestablished. The new concentrations will be different, but the equilibrium constant will be the same. This is unless you change the temperature. Because remember, the equilibrium constants are dependent upon the temperature. And in lab, you will be doing a lab where you look at, you'll be introducing chemical equilibria, and you'll be looking at several different systems and applying different stresses to the system. And you will have to predict how that stress will affect the system. And then you will apply that stress, observe what happened, and then see how your prediction compares to what you actually observed. And it's actually a really cool lab to help you understand Le Chatelier's principle and really reinforce these concepts. Now Le Chatelier's principle, it's almost kind of like a nice governing rule for life. You know, everybody has their own way of balancing things. Everybody has their own natural balance point as they divide up the different areas of their life. And if something gets out of whack, the other things have to compensate until you readjust and refine your balance again. But Le Chatelier's principle doesn't apply to life directly. It's, you know, it states specifically for chemical equilibrium. And Le Chatelier's principle guides us in predicting the effect various changes and conditions have on the position of equilibrium. It says that if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, the position of equilibrium will shift to minimize the disturbance. So it tries to undo what you just did to it. So let's look at the effect of concentrations on equilibria. Adding a reactant will decrease the amounts of other reactants and increase the amount of products until a new position of equilibrium is found. And that has the same K value. Removing a product will increase the amounts of the other products and decrease the amounts of the reactants. You can use this information to drive a reaction to completion. So it means force the reaction to one side of the, the reaction. The equilibrium shifts away from the side with added chemicals or towards the side with removed chemicals. So it tries to undo the stress that you just applied to the system. And just remember that adding more of a solid or liquid does not change its concentration. That's because solids and liquids are pure substances. And so therefore, because they're not part of the equilibrium constant expression, that mass action equation, changing the amounts of those has no effect on the equilibrium. Now let's look at if we disturb an equilibrium by adding reactants. So if we're adding reactants, so A going to B. Adding a reactant initially increases the rate of the forward, direct, forward reaction, but has no initial effect on the rate of the reverse reaction. So it doesn't have any effect on that reverse reaction. The reaction proceeds to the right until the equilibrium is reestablished. So if I increase the concentration of A, so I increase the concentration of A, that reaction will shift to the right to make more B. At the new equilibrium position, you will have more of the products than before, less of the non-added reactants than before, and less of the added reactant, but not as little of the added reactant as you had before the addition. At the new equilibrium position, the concentrations of reactants and products will be such that the value of the equilibrium constant is the same. So let's try disturbing the equilibrium by removing products. So let's say A plus B goes to make C plus D. If we remove a reactant, so let's say we decrease the concentration of A by removing some of A. 
Removing a reactant initially decreases the rate of the forward reaction, but it has no initial effect on the rate of the reverse reaction. So it's going to slow down the reaction in the forward direction, but it's not going to change that in the reverse. But by removing the reaction, it's going to shift this reaction to the left. So we're going to make more of our reactants as we remove the A. So we'll make more of the B. The reaction proceeds to the left until equilibrium is reestablished. At the new equilibrium position, you will have less of the products than before. So you'll have less C plus D because we've shifted the reaction towards the left. We'll have more of the non-removed reactants than before. So it would be more of this B and more of the removed reactant, but not as much of the removed reactant as you had before the removal. And again, at the new equilibrium position, the concentrations of reactants and products will be such that the value of the equilibrium constant is the same. So always when you reach equilibrium, the equilibrium constant always stays the same. Now let's look at the effect of adding a gas to a gas phase reaction at equilibrium. So adding a gaseous reactant increases its partial pressure. So increasing the partial pressure is also going to increase the concentration. So if we add more of this N2O4, we're going to increase the concentration. This is going to cause the reaction to shift to the right. And this increases its partial pressure. We, yeah, increasing the partial pressure increases the concentration. This does not increase the partial pressure of the other gases in the mixture. Now if we add an inert gas to the mixture, this has no effect on the position of the equilibrium. It does not affect the partial pressures of the gases in the reaction. So let's look at the mass action equation for this reaction of N2O4 decomposing into two equivalents of NO2. So remember the equilibrium constant expression is the products of the reactants. So NO2 squared divided by the concentration of N2O4. Notice that helium is not part of the equilibrium. It's just some added gas. And since it's not reacting, you can kind of think of it appearing on both sides of the reaction. If it appears on both sides of the reaction, it's not reacting, it's not doing anything. So if it's not doing anything, it's not going to affect the equilibrium. So adding an inert gas to the mixture has no effect on the position of the equilibrium. So let's look at this graphically. Again, we're looking at the N2O4 decomposing into two equivalents of NO2. So we're starting off with some N2O4 and some NO2. NO2s we're considering our products. And notice that the concentration isn't changing. So we're looking at time on the x-axis, concentration on the y-axis, and these concentrations are constant. Then at this time here where we have the dotted line, we've stressed the system. We've added more NO2, so the concentration of the NO2 has increased because we've added more NO2 to the system. If we increase the concentration of NO2, and we stress the product side, this is going to, so if you increase that NO2 concentration, this is going to push the reaction back towards the reactant. So we, here we're looking at the graph again, we've increased the concentration of NO2, we've stressed it, it says, hey, you added way too much, I've got to undo what you just did by adding more NO2, we're going to lose some of that NO2 now. And that NO2 is then going to be used to make more of the N2O4 reactants. So the N2O4 concentration will actually increase compared to the initial concentration. And the NO2 increased, but it's not as much as when you first added the NO2 to stress the system. But eventually you again reattain equilibrium, so the concentrations remain constant, but notice that the concentrations aren't necessarily the same as what they were before. But if you were to plug in the values for these concentrations, you'll find that the K value for this equilibrium is the same value 
as a k value for this equilibrium because it's the same system, it's just with different concentrations of these. So when NO2 is added, some of it combines to make more N2O4. Now let's look at this same reaction when N2O4 is added. So this time we're increasing the amount of reactant. So if we increase the amount of reactant, this stresses the system, and it's going to push the reaction to the right to make more product. So again, looking at our graph, we've got the N2O4 concentration here. We've got the NO2 concentration represented by the blue line up the top here. The concentrations are constant for this amount of time, so we're at equilibrium. Then we stress the system by adding N2O4. So we've added N2O4. The system says, hey, you've added something. You've thrown me off balance. I want to undo what you just did. So I'm going to convert some of that into a 4 to our product. So we're going to lose some of that into a 4 that we just added to make more NO2. So this is why it shifts the reaction to the right. And so for a period, it's, we're going to have a system where it's not at equilibrium. We've got to have to, we're going to have to express the ratios using the Q and not K. But eventually it does reach equilibrium again where the concentrations remain constant and we reestablish the equilibrium again. And the K value is going to be the same in both situations. So adding a reactant stresses the reaction and pushes the reaction towards the products. Let's look at the effect of volume change on equilibria. Decreasing the size of a container increases the concentration of all the gases in the container. This is because it increases their partial pressure. If their partial pressures increase, then the total pressure in the container will also increase. According to Le Chatelier's principle, the equilibrium should shift to remove that pressure. The way the system reduces the pressure is to reduce the number of gas molecules in the container. When the volume decreases, the equilibrium shifts to the side with fewer gas molecules. So we're going to use that same reaction before the dinitrogen tetraoxide, and we're going to apply heat to decompose it to form two equivalents of NO2, and this is a brown gas. So the N2O4 is colorless, but when it breaks down, it makes the, the brown NO2 gas. And you actually have a video that you can watch. This video, you can find it on blackboard. So you can watch that video on blackboard. But let's say we have the system of the N2O4 and the two equivalents of the nitrogen oxide gas, the NO2. And the system's at equilibrium. And I have a container. And you've got a piston at the top of this container and we have a mixture of the different gases in here. If I then apply pressure and move the piston down so that all my gas molecules are trapped within here compared to having this larger space over here, if I decrease the volume, I increase the pressure. So to compensate for this, if I increase the pressure, the reaction is going to want to shift to relieve that stress. So it's going to go to the side with fewer moles of gas. So this side of the reaction has two moles of gas. This only has one. So if I decrease the size of the container, I increase the pressure. Increasing the pressure increases the concentration. And it's going to want to cause that reaction to shift to the reactant side. Now the converse of that, if I increase the volume, I decrease the pressure, and then the system will move towards the right. It'll move in the opposite direction. So disturbing the equilibrium, reducing the volume. For solids, liquids, or solutions, changing the size of the container has no effect on the concentration, therefore no effect on the position of equilibrium. Decreasing the container volume would increase the total pressure. This is Boyle's law, so you have to remember this from your ideal gas law. If the total pressure increases, the partial pressures of all the gases will increase. 
this is related to Dalton's law of partial pressures. Decreasing the container volume increases the concentrations of all gases. You have the same number of moles but different numbers of liters and that results in a different molarity. Since the total pressure increases, the position of equilibrium will shift to decrease the pressure by removing gas molecules. This means it shifts towards the side with fewer gas molecules. At the new equilibrium position, the partial pressures of gaseous reactants and products will be such that the value of the equilibrium constant is the same. Now we can look at the effect of temperature changes on equilibrium position. Remember that exothermic reactions release energy, so you're taking money out of your chemical energy bank account. Those are negative delta H's, and think of energy as a product. So if you're releasing energy, think of it being a product in your reaction. Endothermic reactions, however, absorb energy. Since you're putting energy in, think of that as a deposit into your energy bank account, and that's a positive delta H and you can think of energy as a reactant. If we write heat as a product in an exothermic reaction or as a reactant in an endothermic reaction, it will help us to use Le Chatelier's principle to predict the effect of temperature changes, even though heat is not matter and not written in a proper equation. So in, if we're looking at an exothermic reaction, if I increase the temperature, this is going to drive the reaction to the left to make more reactants. However, with the endothermic reaction, if I increase the heat, this will push the reaction towards the right, towards products. You'll make more products. And vice versa, if I decrease the temperature, if I make it colder, it's going to push the reaction to the left. So there is another video on Blackboard that you can watch with nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen tetraoxide. And you can see here where you have the system. So this is that same equilibrium that we looked at before. The N2O4 is colorless and the NO2 gas is brown. So if we cool the reaction off, if we lower the temperature, this is going to cause a shift in the reaction to make more N2O4. So this should make more the N2O4, which is colorless. And notice here in this picture here that this glass ampule that contains this equilibrium mixture is colorless in, while it's sitting in the ice bath. If we increase the temperature, we're stressing the reactant side. This is going to cause the reaction to shift towards the products. This will cause more the N2O gas to be formed, and this is a brown gas. So you can see at the higher temperature, the NO2 favor is favored, and we see the brown color of the gas being formed. So this is the same ampule in both situations, it's just at different temperatures. And remember we said that temperature affects the equilibrium constant? So at the colder temperature, the equilibrium lies closer to the reactants, and at the warmer temperature, it lies more towards the products. So some things that you can add that don't change the position of the equilibrium, one of those is a catalyst. A catalyst provides an alternative, more efficient mechanism for a reaction. It works for both forward and reverse reactions. It affects the rate of the forward and reverse reactions by the same factor. Therefore, catalysts do not affect the position of equilibrium. It affects the rates of the reaction, but they do not affect the position of the equilibrium. Let's have some practice with the Chatelier's principle. We're looking at the reaction where we have two equivalents of sulfur dioxide, and they combine with one equivalent of oxygen gas to form two equivalents of SO3, sulfur trioxide and it has a delta H of negative 198 kilojoules. We want to know how the following changes affect the equilibrium concentrations of each gas once the equilibrium is reestablished. So what would happen if you added more O2 to the container? So as we go through these, you may want to pause after we ask, pose the question, see what you predict, and see if that matches what you thought would happen. So if we add more O2 to the container, 
we're going to increase the concentration of O2 that should p push the reaction towards more SO3. So it should shift to more SO3. If we condense and remove some of the SO3, so we're lowering the concentration of the SO3 when we condense it and we take it out, that too should also push the reaction to the right. If we compress the gas, what do you think would happen? Notice that there are two equivalents of gas on the right hand side and there are three equivalents of gas on the reactant side. So if there are three equivalents on the left and two on the right, if I increase the pressure by compressing the gas, the reaction is going to want to shift towards the right. So we should shift more SO3. If I cool the container, I'm taking away heat. So when I look at my delta H, my delta H is a negative, so that means I'm losing energy out of my system. So that should be on the product side, so 2SO3 plus the 198. So I'm losing that much energy as I produce the SO3. So if I cool the container, I'm losing that heat, so that should also shift to the SO3. If I double the volume of the container, if I double the volume of the container, I'm decreasing the pressure. So this is going to be the opposite of compressing the gases. This should cause a shift to SO2. If I warm the mixture, this should have the opposite effect of cooling it. So this should shift to SO2 as well. If I add helium to the container, notice helium is not part of my balanced chemical equation for the equilibrium. So if I add helium, what would be the effect? Hopefully you answered no effect. What about if we add the catalyst to the mixture? How will this affect the equilibrium? Hopefully too you also answered no effect. So that concludes our video lectures for chapter 14.